Good morning, brothers and sisters. Hello. Sorry, as we get settled. Hello, my name is Liam Timonti, and I have the privilege of serving as uh, the SMU president. Um, today, we're doing something unique for chapel. We are having a panel with these four wonderful individuals. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves real quick, and then I'll keep talking. Let's go ahead, Angel. Yeah. I'm Angel J. Dawson, and I'm the director. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, I'm the director of administrative services for SMU, SGA, and SPA. I'm Bulus Galadim. I'm the dean of uh, the school, uh, Cook School of Intercultural Studies. Ooh. I'm Joanne Jung, and I get to teach here. <laughs> and I'm Chris Johnson, the campaign marketing manager. I work in advancement. Ooh. Well, thank you guys for joining us on a Monday before Thanksgiving. Um, today, we're just going to have a conversation about what it means to love your neighbor. Uh, I know as a student here, I hear that term or that phrase, I guess, a lot. Um, and we see it clearly commanded in Matthew 22 when Jesus states, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, I know that we've been told that a lot. I know that oftentimes while here at Biola, I've wondered what does it truly look like to love your neighbor? So today we're going to have a fun little conversation about that with questions. So yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump right into it. So please bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for bringing us all here today, Lord. Um, it's been a nice cold morning. I love the cold. I pray that you would just be present, Lord, as uh, these four panelists speak from their heart, and I pray that you would just be present with all of us as we enter into Thanksgiving break. Um, as Sophia talked about, it's just a wonderful privilege to go back home or stay here or wherever we're, whatever we're doing for Thanksgiving um, and share your love. Um, and I pray that you just allow us to understand what you truly command of us to love our neighbor. In your name, amen. Awesome. So, first question for our lovely guest here. What do you guys think it means to love your neighbor? Well, I can start. Um, I think the biggest thing is recognizing that our human flesh does not want to love our neighbor, and we are, that doesn't come naturally to us. Um, we're going to always want to act um, depending on what's convenient for us at that right time. Um, and so for me, I always think that quiet time in the morning is so important, um, and asking the Lord, knowing that we don't want to love our neighbor um, as an instinct, um, praying for the fruits of the Spirit, but especially for me, it's patience and gentleness when dealing with, um, interacting with other people, um, just because in conflict, your ability or inability to be patient or to be gentle would be, is very aware, so. Awesome. You can go. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I think for me, um, I go back to a verse that I learned uh, when I was a kid, uh, John 3.16. Now, if you really love God, if I really love God, it's going to move me to respond and be Christ-like. And uh, Scripture teaches us that uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, Christ, when he came, modeled that for us. And one of the things that Christ said was, a greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Now, the greatest love you can show to someone is actually to love them the way Jesus loves you and the way Jesus loves them. That's, that's, that's a challenge because naturally, I mean, I don't want to do that. I'm always thinking about myself. So uh, for me, what it means to love my neighbor is to be so concerned about them that I'm concerned about their well-being, which would mean not only physical, but it's also going to be spiritual, social, and in all ways, uh, whatever the Lord shows me that I need to do for this person, I need to respond. So that's what it means to me. I think springboarding on both um, these two previous comments is that um, it can be an indicator of how much or how well and how deeply we love God in how we love others. That's kind of a, 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 a rude awakening 
that your love for God shows up in how you love others, and how you love others shows up in how we love God. Remembering that in John, uh, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. So our love quotient is, uh, is synced with our obedience quotient. So it's easy to say, I love God and love people, but then what is our obedience quotient? How strongly, how regularly, how faithfully do we obey God? And so it can be so unsexy to love people, right? To really, I think, go without obedience. Um, I mean, it looks like the boring, mundane, you're sitting in the airport, ready to go home this Thanksgiving, in line at security, and someone is being rude to you. How do you love them, you know? I think it's the going home to family, and it's considering others greater than yourself. And I, I think loving other people can be so boring <laughs> that we sometimes overcomplicate it. And so loving our neighbor is simply saying, I want to put you first. I want to put your needs above my own. And uh, I think sometimes we want it to be so much greater than that. We want it to be some, something more, um, something more flashy. But I think the reality is when we obey what the Lord is calling us to do, putting other people before us, uh, that's what it looks like to love our neighbor. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Um, this next question is from your guys' personal experience. So in your walks through life, how have, uh, what does it look like to love those around you, and how has the gospel uh, compelled you to love others? Well, l let me start. Um, I think in, in my walk, I mean, I've been, you can tell that I've been around the block uh, for in, in Nigeria, you would say we've been, I've been around the block uh, a few moons, uh, but I think I want to tell just two quick uh, stories about my experience of working with the Lord. One is uh, my father-in-law. Um, he took ill kind of suddenly, four years into our marriage, uh, he took ill. And on his deathbed, one of the things he said was uh, he didn't call the pastor he called me. He told people to look for me. And when I came to his uh, sick bed, we didn't know that uh, his sickness was going to lead to his death. Uh, he said to me, Bulus, um, I, would, I want to give my life to Christ. Now, that shocked me. Uh, he's known me at that point for nine years. I dated my wife for five years, and then we got married. So this was four years into our marriage. Uh, when he said that, the only thing I can say is he's observed my wife's life and my life uh, through this period. And I have been praying for him at this time for nine years that he would come to make this decision for Christ. And on his deathbed, on sick bed, he said, uh, could you lead me to Christ? So that was, uh, I mean, one of the rarest moments in my life. So I prayed for him. Now, Remember that it's been nine years I have been praying for this to happen. And I didn't know it was going to be the last thing I would do. So I uh, prayed for him, led him to Christ. Two days later, he went to be with the Lord. Now, you can just imagine the joy I had. Now, I have a cousin. Uh, my cousin's name is uh, Ishaku. That's Isaac uh, in English. Uh, we grew up together, and all of his life, he was an alcoholic. I have shared Christ with him numerous times, and I can tell you that uh, I did everything. Wanted him to come to know Christ at different moments. I would say, this is what you need to do. But it was, he died two years ago. Three years before he died, he got really sick. And I called one of my friends who was a doctor and said, please, could you take care of him? It was actually my friend who led him to Christ. You know how long I've been praying for him to come to know Christ? 35 years. 35 years. And I can tell you there were times that I prayed for him multiple times a week, multiple times a day just that he would come to know Christ. But here is the thing. It didn't happen with me leading him to Christ, but I was glad that he came to know Christ. Um, 
I'm sharing this just to encourage you. One of the things you need to do is actually to pray for whoever God is leading you, is leading you or impressing upon your heart, family members. And I, I know that when you trust God this way, it's going to work. God is the one who takes these words of ours, feeble words of ours, and impresses them upon the hearts of people and leads them to himself. So uh, th there are so many mistakes I made in the process of talking with my cousin Ishakwa. If I tell you that I did everything right every time, I'm telling a lie. There were times that I blew it, but God in his mercy drew all of these people to himself. Uh, but there are people that I am still praying for 40 years into my Christian walk with the Lord who still haven't come to know Christ yet. I think another way to love people well is the secret art of just listening. Um, I think in our world today, there's so many people talking, um, regardless of where you fall in the political kind of spectrum. I think there's so much of this season that's been a lot of talking, a lot of yelling, a lot of just general noise. And I think one of the things that opens people up the most to be loved is to listen, to actually listen to them and not forget their name in five seconds, um, but to actually say, you know, what do you want to share with me this season? I think there's kind of a, a temptation over Thanksgiving to go home and talk a lot about what you've experienced, what you've done, uh, and forget that people have also had those experiences too that they want to share and they don't get a chance to. I think loving people can start with just listening. Um, there's an uncle of mine who loves to talk, and I think one of the cool things about getting to share your story is listening, they feel bad after a while. They start talking and they're talking and they realize, oh, I haven't actually let them talk and you can share and they listen to you as well. So that reciprocity of saying, I'm gonna to listen to you first, I'm gonna actually hear what you're saying, and then I'm gonna love you by sharing what I've experienced this last season. Um, I heard this story about two years ago. I think it was in a book by David Platt, but I'm not sure. Um, but it was a story about how if someone were to get hit by a bus, that person would not look different, or that person would not look the same, they would not speak the same. They would not walk the same. And in the same way, when you get hit by the gospel, um, in a way, you're not supposed to look the same, and you're not supposed to talk the same, and you're not supposed to love others the same. Um, and so that story kind of has always stuck with me of just, um, we can't half-heartedly know the gospel and then not love others well. Kind of what Dr. Jung said about um, the way we love God is going to come out in the way we love others. My grandson was given a book when he was born, and it's titled, I Wish You More. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It's a quick read, very quick read, very quick read. Uh, but one of the pages just really struck me. The author writes, I wish you more pause than fast forward. And I took that to heart. We, as Chris mentioned, we really do, do need more pause. I think the scary thing, though, is that pause can be frightening. What will God say? What will he require me to do? And as um, Bola says, how will I respond when God says, in your pause, I'm asking you to forgive? Colossians 3.13, if anyone has a complaint against anyone else, he must forgive. As Christ forgave you, you must also forgive. So as Christ loved first, then we can love. As Christ forgives, then we are to forgive. And I think that's one of the most clearest messages of the gospel, is the way we forgive. And I suspect that many of us, when we are gathered around that Thanksgiving table, will have thoughts of unforgiveness. And in those moments, I trust we will hear God saying, forgive. Thank you. Um, next question. How do you love your neighbor without compromising convictions? Love first. <laughs> Just go out there, do it first. Uh, then you don't have to compromise any convictions. You don't know where, they're sta where they stand. Just do it first. Um, be, be on the edge. Be and walk forward. Um, I'd like to give this example. Um, that, uh, um, what's it, uh, Rick Warren gave many, many, I would say decades ago. And he would say everything that uh, 
every way that God has made us is to move forward. And I don't know why we, we don't, but you think about our eyes and our nose and our ears and our hands, our elbows, our knees and our feet. Everything in how we have been designed is to move forward. And God has given us everything to move forward. So why are we stagnant? We are to move forward. There is one part, pardon the pun, but there is one part of our anatomy that is designed to leave stuff behind. But even when that functions, it functions so that we can move forward. So take the first step. Sorry. <laughs> that is amazing. I want that for sure. I think with that, it's a sense of when you, a lot of times we're trying so hard to be right, to be the one who is established because we're so afraid that we won't be right and we won't be accepted or loved. Um, so I think one thing is to approach it knowing that you are fully loved as you are. Um, many times at Thanksgiving you want to come home and prove to your family that you are amazing, that you didn't waste that last semester of tuition, that you've accomplished so much and you want to establish yourself as the strong force moving forward. I think the bigger thing is realizing how much you've already accomplished just by being in the room by being at home, that you're fully loved. I know family can be tough, that majority of us here don't have um, homes that are, that are great to go back to. Um, I came from a broken home as well. And to know that I was fully loved by a father who could do more than my family ever could do, puts you in a position where you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to keep pushing yourself forward um, to say, I have to be right. But you can actually say, I'm already moving forward by being here. I'm already doing what he's asking me to do by simply being present. And, um, and that's huge. That's a huge step. Um, I am definitely one who likes to argue. And so I think for me to say, can I take a step back and listen? Can I say, you know, how can I move this other person forward without having to push my agenda first? Uh, I think you can hold conviction by simply accepting that you're fully who you need to be in this moment. Well, I mean, I, I just want to uh, add that um, one of the challenges we face as evangelicals is that we hold our convictions and want everyone to actually agree with us. We, we kind of feel as if we are on a crusade, and the crusade is to get everyone on my side, and if people just say either I am not ready or I don't believe that or I don't agree with that. We feel as if that's an invitation to argue more, to speak more, and to try to get them to our, our side. And sometimes in the process of doing that, we become unkind. And uh, I think around, well, the U.S. now and probably <laughs> the world, evangelicals are not known to be gracious and kind people. And that's us. And sometimes that hurts because it's the way we've been conditioned. It looks like we have to be right every time because we have the word of God. But what we need is uh, to actually be gentle, to be kind, to understand that uh, people are somewhere yet. They are not where we are. And my task is actually to trust God and to say, please help me to be kind and loving, even in the process of that. Now, remember that Scripture teaches us that God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, which means that even the person who disagrees with me, I need to love them. I need to be kind towards them. I need to be gentle. All of the fruit of the Spirit are actually meant to be lived out in that type of a situation. So I can be, I can hold to my conviction, continue to trust God, and it may result in persecution, difficulties, but I still remain there, but still gentle, not unkind. I come from a pretty diverse family in ethnicity, beliefs, um, there's half Indian, half German, half Filipino, all of that, and then we all say we're Christian, but we, I would say that we believe um, very different things, and so I think in the light of Thanksgiving, 
um, knowing that I'm going to be seeing my family, um, especially one of my cousins. Um, we believe very different things and um, have very different concepts of right and wrong. Um, and so I think remembering that not to compromise your convictions, um, but be so gentle and so loving is so important. Um, Dr. Lundy said this um, quote two years ago, and I always remember it, especially when interacting with this one cousin of mine, and he said, um, have a gracious presence without validating things that you don't believe in. Um, and I go back to that every single time I interact with my cousin. And so, yeah, I think just the concept of um, being fully present in that conversation with that person, but also being like a little too gentle and a little too loving because um, that can never go the wrong way. So, Awesome. Um, as we get on last, these last few minutes, what, uh, do you guys have any passages or do you have some words of wisdom for us as we go into Thanksgiving break? Yeah, I do. I wrote them down on this card. <laughs> um, those of you who have had me recently in classes um, know that I have um, encouraged you to read Psalm 139. And for those irregular people, you know, you have an irregular piece of clothing at the store and they mark it down because there's a loose thread. Well, Joyce Landor talks about us being irregular people. But I think there's one way when we talk about God and we pray, God, help me to love people, help me to... Uh, see people the way you see them. I think praying Psalm 139 over them and putting the appropriate name and pronoun in uh, really works, and I've been teaching this for a couple of years. I'm just going to use Liam's name, if he doesn't mind, for this. And I won't read the whole psalm, and you want to avoid um, praying Psalm 139 verses 19 to 21. That just doesn't apply. But here, the rest of it does. So if I were to use Liam's name, it would be Lord, you have searched Liam and know him. You know when he sits down and when he stands up. You understand his thoughts from afar. You observe his travels and his rest. You are aware of all of Liam's ways. Before a word is on Liam's tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You have encircled Liam. You have placed your hand on him. This extraordinary knowledge is beyond him. It is lofty. Liam is unable to reach it. Where, he, where can he go to escape your spirit? Where can he flee from your presence? If he goes to heaven, you are there. And if he makes his bed in Sheol, you are there. He lives in the eastern horizon or the settlement or settles in the western limits, even there your hand will lead him. Your right hand will hold on to Liam. If he says, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, God. For it was you who created Liam's inward parts. You knit him together in his mother's womb. He will praise you because he has been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and he knows that full well. Nothing was hidden from your sight. Liam was made in secret when Liam was formed in the deepest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw Liam when he was formless. All of his days are written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. God, how difficult your thoughts are for Liam to comprehend. I could go on with the rest of it, but praying this psalm over someone with whom you have a strained or challenging relationship actually transforms us and being able to see them as made in the image of God. And perhaps when we take that pause, we'll open our Bibles and turn to Psalm 139 and we'll pray this over someone and we will pray expectantly that God changes us 
and perhaps as God changes us and our view in how we now see someone else the way God sees them, it will indeed change them. I love the book of Mark because it's to the point. It's very short uh, compared to the other gospels and says this is what he's done, this is what he's doing. And there's a passage in Mark 10 where it's just kind of this example after example of Jesus trying to introduce the idea of being a servant and being last. And the disciples just are not getting it. Um, so he brings children and says, let the children come, they'll be first. Um, you have this rich man who comes up and says, I've done everything, what else should I do? Basically saying, I'm all that. And a bag of chips like Jesus, you should recognize how great I am. And Jesus says, yeah, that's great, but do one other thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the disciples are getting upset because they said, we left everything. This is impossible. How do we serve? How do we follow you in this? And Jesus says that many will be, um, who are first will be last and last will be first. And this concept is so simple, but it's so hard. Because when we go home, if you're like me, you just want to share about all the amazing things um, you're going to see on Instagram everyone's perfect, amazing turkey dinner, perfectly portioned and taken from the right angle. And you look at your family and your mess and you say, how come I can't be first for once? Why can't I have this example of a life for once? Why can't my family seem to get this together? And I think what I want to encourage those of you who don't have the perfect Instagram family is that Jesus is constantly showing us that when we have all these trials, all these things in our lives that make us look like we're last, maybe he's choosing to do this to elevate us later. And that if we wait, if we pursue him and trust him for what is coming, instead of trying to grab for the things now and saying, I can be first now, I can have the most amazing story, the first one to share at the dinner table and say, I'm going to wait, I'm going to listen and trust that he is going to elevate this moment for his glory um, then maybe you might recognize down the road that that moment actually brought you forward. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, wherever you're at in this room today, as you're planning to take all that homework that they just assigned you home for the weekend, um, that in the moment when you really want to be first, when you want to put yourself forward, take a second and say, God, what do you want to do to elevate this moment? And the last thing, a really just tactical, practical tip, um, look for one person that you're going to meet with this week and ask their why. Why are they doing what they're doing? Make their purpose first. And I think you're going to see some amazing things happen by the Holy Spirit. I love um, reading Romans 12. Um, that's just a passage that I constantly go back to. And um, especially where it says, honor each other above ourselves. Um, and I think we have to look into the word honor. I think we kind of skim over it sometimes, or at least I do. Um, and honoring just doesn't mean um, being civil with that person or um, sometimes silence speaks louder. And so um, in, in the context of going home for, th for Thanksgiving, um, I would just really meditate on what the word honor means um, and honoring the person that is so different from you or the family member who talks too much or um, has such diverse views. Um, what does it look like to honor them? Um, and, and that being so gentle, I think covering yourself in gentleness is like the key thing to Christianity. Um, and sometimes we forget that being passionate about the gospel doesn't always have to mean screaming the gospel. It, it means being gentle with it. Well, I just, uh, let me share uh, on probably just three things very quickly. I know our time is almost up. Uh, the first uh, advice I would give you is uh, this whole business of uh, sharing Christ, sharing the gospel, is actually one of the most intense spiritual battles you would engage in. And the reason is simply this. Satan is against the idea of having people come into the kingdom of Christ. For that reason, he is going to mount all sorts of opposition against you. So Satan is against this. The devil would do everything to discourage you, but you need the armor of God and you need the strength of Christ and God to wage this battle. So you need to pray. Spiritual conversations are not things that you just engage in casually. 
This is an intense battle. Now, understand this, that the enemy is not your neighbor. It's not your family member. The enemy is actually Satan. And sometimes we kind of think the person we're sharing Christ with is the enemy. That's not the enemy. It's actually Satan. This person is the person that we love, but the battle is against the, uh, the, the devil. So you, you, you need God's help in order to wage this battle. So that's the first thing. Now, as you pray, you pray first for yourself that God would fill you with love and compassion for this person. Naturally, we don't love. Naturally, we are not compassionate. Just like Chris was sharing, we think about ourselves first. So you need God to work in your heart, to work on you, to make you that person that would be loving, that would be kind, that would be gentle as you reach out. So uh, the second thing I wanted to share with you is uh, to encourage you this battle can only be won through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said to his disciples, you wait, then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Then you'd be able to share the gospel. You need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit as you engage in this. Now, the Spirit is going to ask you to do some things that would be scary. But sometimes the Spirit would also ask you to do things that are counterintuitive. You would think, I mean, this is very clear. I can just go ahead and do this. And the Holy Spirit might say to you, no, it's not the time. Just wait on me. So here you have to cultivate a deep relationship with God all the time. That even as you speak, you don't speak in arrogance or with pride. You speak actually with humility. You speak trembling because it's about the Lord, not about you. Okay, very quickly, the third thing I wanted to share with you is uh, the word of God. Jesus himself said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Now, here is the interesting thing about salt and light. If you have too much salt in food, I mean, that food is no longer tasty. I mean, you don't want to eat it. Now, if there is light shining, if the light shining on you is too bright, just like these spotlights, what they do is they blind you, right? You can't actually see. You can't function well. But when salt is just enough, you don't even taste the salt but you just know it's there. And when the light shines well, just enough, it allows you to carry on your function. Now, as you go this Thanksgiving, as you spend time with family and friends, remember to be the light. Remember to be the salt, but just enough being led by the Holy Spirit. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.